Hi, I'm Sophie Thomas and you're listening to Raw 12.51am. I'm with George Eaton, political editor of The New Statesman. Um, he's here for a talk on Britain and the world uh, with the Warwick Politics Society um, and for are doing an interview with George. So, first question that uh, we have for you is kind of, where do you see Britain's position in global politics? Hmm. Well, it's one in flux because uh-huh. Uh, one of the essential pillars of Britain's place in the world for decades has been uh, Europe and the UK. It's, it's, there's never been a state that's left the, the EU before, and of course, that event is going to inflict great economic and, and political turmoil on, on the country. And I don't think there's there's a good outcome. I think there are varying degrees of bad outcomes because whatever deal Britain gets, I think it will get a deal. Uh, the, the, the risk of no deal is clearly there. It won't be good as the deal has at the moment. So, in a, in a recent article that you wrote for the New Statesman, uh, you referred to the UK as the sick man of Europe, mm. um, which I thought was a very interesting uh, like metaphor for the UK. Yeah. Um, what treatment do you think that the UK could have to try and make it better? The, single, the single best treatment would be to stop Brexit. That would yeah. be <laughs> the biggest boost you could give the economy. Uh, the sick man of Europe was the term that was first applied to Britain in the, in the 1970s, uh, when it was suffering from low growth, mm-hmm. high inflation, high unemployment, they called it stagflation. Mm-hmm. And ironically, one of the reasons that the UK joined the European project to begin with was, was because it was tired of seeing its competitors, France, Germany and so on, outpacing it. And it's almost as if Britain's going to have to learn the lesson again, because even though we haven't formally left the EU yet, we, we've gone from being one of the fastest growing economies in, in the EU to one of the slowest. Um, and the idea that we're going to leave the EU and, and sign all of these uh, incredibly uh, valuable trade deals that compensate for the losses from Europe is, is unfortunately to the delusion. Yeah, so kind of linking onto that as well, like, do you think that Britain is losing superiority because you've got France and Germany that are potentially sort of overtaking Britain's status in the European Union? That, do you see Britain losing their superiority? Yes, because in terms of the world, the only way in which Britain, I think, can have the kind of influence that um, the government would want it to have is through the, the European project. Yeah. The US and China, they don't look at Europe as isolated countries, mm-hmm. they see it as, as, as a bloc. Now, Britain won't uh, be irrelevant out of the mm-hmm. EU. Um, it, it will still have a seat in the UN Security Council, it will still be a leading member of NATO, um, it will still have one of the world's largest economies, it will be one that's potentially declining, but it's more the difference between reality and potential. That Britain had a, a pretty good deal with the EU in the sense that it had all the benefits of being part of the single market. It wasn't a member of the Euro, um, it wasn't a member of the, the borderless Schengen zone, it had a 4.8 billion pound budget rebate, and it's going to lose a lot of the, uh, the benefits of, of European membership. Uh, without really much to show for it. Yeah. Uh, there is the issue of immigration, of course, and I think that was, that was what drove the, the lead vote. And clearly, the only way you can potentially significantly limit free movement is outside of the, the single market. But again, I'm, I'm not sure that voters, voters might like a low immigration economy in, in, in theory, but whether they like it in practice, I'm, I'm less sure. Because one of the reasons why the UK has grown stronger than some European countries in recent years was because of the uh, foreign labour it was able to attract, to fill vacancies which in some cases would otherwise go under. Mm, interesting. So with um, like immigration being such a hot topic at the moment um, and with a lot of decisions being made in kind of immigration at the forefront, uh, do you think that decisions in politics today are being made at the potential loss of peace and kind of peaceful ideas that could be happening in politics? I think Europe has, after obviously being a very war-torn continent and past experience, decades of peace, and that is one of the great achievements of the, the EU. And I think one of the reasons that Britain's departure is so disruptive is because the world is in a state of disorder. Yeah. You've got the long-term threats of, of climate change. You've got uh, the US led by um, the most volatile, uh, and some ways the most contemptible leader it's ever had. Yes. And uh, you've got uh, the need for the West to, to balance the, the rise of, of China. You've got uh, nuclear threats in the, in the form of North Korea and others. Uh, 
um, and Britain has added a whole new dimension of uh, instability and, and risk. So I think in terms of promoting peace and stability, then, then Britain leaving the EU is, is, is profoundly unhelpful. But I don't doubt that Britain and the EU will continue to have uh, an engaged security relationship. Yeah. Um, it's, it was quite telling that at the start of the year, when the government triggered Article 50, they made uh, an implicit, almost explicit threat to the EU, which is that if you don't give us a deal that we think is good enough, well, we can stop sharing intelligence with you, we can end our security cooperation. And they, and they, they, they took that card, actually, uh, they took that, they rescinded that threat because they recognised that um, the EU was not going to be blackmailed in that manner. Yeah, it, it's an interesting one to do with politics and peace. Um, in a tweet that you made recently, um, you were discussing about the EU's departure from the European Union, um, and you kind of, re you referred to it as comical, I was wondering if you could kind of explain that a bit more, just because I thought that was quite a different word mm. to use for leaving the European Union. Yeah, it's it's darkly comic. In yeah. the sense that if, if you go back to 2016, what cabinet ministers like David Davis and Liam Fox were saying is, by uh, the end of the, the two-year negotiating period, or even earlier than that, we'll have a whole suite of trade deals that we're going mm -hmm. to be able to sign. And it's quite Trump-esque language. It, it, retrospect is something we're going to have the best it's going to be the best trade deal you've ever seen we don't need Europe yeah. and of course the reality is that Britain's not going to be able to sign any new trade deals uh, with other countries until it leaves the, the EU and even then we're going to have a transition period now in theory a two-year transition period where we're outside of the EU but we essentially still play by most of the same rules and the Brexit is always that that wouldn't be needed that no look we can we can't just we can sort the divorce in two years and we can sign a new trade deal and so on every front, throughout the process, the Brexiteers have had to make concessions. Mm -hmm. uh, Boris Johnson used to say the EU could go whistle uh, if they thought Britain was going to pay a divorce bill. We learned this week it's like that Britain's like to sum up around £50 billion pounds for, for the divorce bill. So Brexit has been a process of the Leave supporters uh, delaying the inevitable and then, and then accepting it. And in many ways, it is a, a laughable prize situation. Yeah, it's, it's one of those situations that I think most people just kind of don't really know what to do because it's just kind of, what can the, what can the normal person really do when it comes to Brexit? Yes, yeah, so of course, they can, um, they can punish politicians at the bad mm -hmm. points. And that was one of the big reasons why the Conservatives lost their majority. Even though Labour is not an anti-Brexit party, though its position mm -hmm. could yet shift, there's no doubt that the referendum, which was happened just a year before yeah. the general election, was a huge force engaging young people in politics, mm -hmm. far more engaged than, than when I was at uh, university here. And that was what drove the revolt against the Conservatives in seats like Warrington and Leamington, which the Conservatives held. So those, those were seats that they captured off Labour, where you had um, often uh, quite an affluent position, see lots of liberal students, and those voter blocks who in the main voted to stay in the EU, uh, took their revenge against the Conservatives. And that's why Theresa May has no, no majority today. Yes, yeah, so linking on to Theresa May and kind of losing her majority in the election this year, do you think that negotiations um, with the European Union to do with Brexit have been, have been harmed by like recent um, allegations of Conservative party members? You've got, um, just off the top of my head, you've got like Priti Patel mm. and other uh, people in her cabinet leaving. Do you think that this has harmed Brexit negotiations? It's, it has absolutely weakened Theresa May's position mm. because uh, the EU are aware that uh, she desperately needs um, to get a uh, framework agreement so that they, they can begin trade with that. If the EU decides uh, next month that Britain hasn't made sufficient progress on the, the three big issues they're trying to resolve at the moment, the divorce bill, citizens' rights, and the Irish border, mm -hmm. Theresa May's position is, is, is further weakened. And, and when um, uh, Nick Clegg met uh, Michelle Barnier recently, he had this group of remaining politicians, Nick Clegg, Andrew Donis, and Ken Clark, who went over to the um, sort of parallel process to uh, Barnier's meetings with, with David Davis and the UK government. One subject they discussed was just how fragile the British government is. Britain's historically been quite a stable country in Europe, mm -hmm. not, not a country where you have constant elections, yeah. constant coalition formations. And the EU negotiators are very aware that Theresa May is a prisoner of her party, that she serves at their pleasure, and that the second they decide that the benefits of having made their outweigh, that the costs of having made their outweigh the benefits, then, then she'll be gone. 
And so they are prepared for the possibility that you may have a different Prime Minister concluding the Brexit negotiations. As things stand, I think it's likely that they may will. But if you, as the Prime Minister, are aware that your party could get rid of you at any moment, and the person on the other side is, you don't have a strong hand in the negotiations. And that's one reason why it's the UK that's been having to make concessions, not the EU. And just one quick final mm. question to do with um, Theresa May and the kind of concession that she's been making with Brexit. Um, do you think that the next Prime Minister will be Conservative, or do you think it will switch to the opposition? Or where, where do you see it going? As things stand, I think Labour are the most likely to form the next government. Mm -hmm. Whether that's the majority, or I think more likely is the largest party in a, in a home parliament. I think that's because usually the longer they're in office, the harder it becomes for governments to recover. Mm -hmm. uh, the Conservatives still like to talk about Labour's Great Recession and say that's why um, we still got a, a, a deficit, that's why the economy. But the longer, by the time of the, the next election, the Conservatives would have been in power potentially for 12 years. That's a so long time. It's, it's, it, it, it's a long time. Yeah. And the Brexit negotiations, as things like the forecasts for the, the economy getting worse, not better. Uh, but so much depends on who the Conservatives' next leader is. It, it is hard to imagine someone running a worse general election campaign than, than Theresa May. Yeah. But I think if you look at the Conservative election, the kind of leader they're going to elect could well be someone who is uh, significantly to the right of the general public on most, on most issues. I think if the Conservatives are to recover, then they need to break with austerity completely, not, not, not marginally, and to offer the investments and, and rising living standards that, that the public want. Because if they feel that the only way to get those improvements is through Labour, then I think they, I think they will choose the opposition. No, I, I personally agree. I do think it will go to a Labour government, not Conservative, just because of the kind of um, issues that the Conservative government has recently had. Um, I do think most people will try and distance themselves from the Conservative yeah. Party and go to the opposition. Mm. But the caveat to that is, is historically the Conservatives do have this remarkable ability, ability to regenerate themselves. Yeah. Just as it looks like they've lost it. Labour thought in 1992 that that election was in the bag for them, mm. uh, but John Major and Chris Thatcher and, and, and took over managed to uh, regenerate the Conservatives. So uh, I think it's crucial that Labour don't underestimate the Conservatives, don't assume, don't take the electorate for granted. And rather than sort of drifting towards power, Labour have to advance towards it with, with momentum, um, act like a government in waiting, um, don't just assume that the voters will flock to you because they don't like the other one. I think that's a wonderful point to finish on. So this is Sophie Thomas with George Eaton, political editor of The New Statesman uh, for the Britain and the World Talk with Warwick Politics Society for Raw 1251 AM.